Hi, and welcome to the Punk CX podcast. My name is Adrian Swinsko, and I'm an advisor, best-selling author, speaker, and general explorer when it comes to customer and employee experience. I'm really interested in figuring out what it takes to build organizations that produce better outcomes for both customers and employees. So with that in mind, I seek out and interview CEOs, entrepreneurs, business and tech leaders, authors and academics to uncover some clues about what it takes to build this such an organization. Now, some of you may know the podcast as the Rare Business Podcast, but I decided to rename and rebrand the podcast recently. This is for a number of reasons. First one was to mirror the title of my book, Punk CX, which was published in June 2019. Uh, two, because I'm a fan of punk music. And three, it's just more fun, right? Anyway, if this is your first time listening to one of these interviews, then hello and welcome. And please do dive into the archives at adrianswinsko.com as I've now completed over 300 of these interviews in the last few years. If this is not your first time listening, then welcome back and thank you. Anyway, that's enough for me right now. Let's get into the interview. So welcome to the next edition of the Punk CX podcast. With me today, I have an old friend of the podcast, is James Dodkins, who is commonly known as a CX rock star, but now is also the CX evangelist at Pega. Hey, James, how are you doing? I'm doing really well, mate. Thank you for having me back. You're very welcome. Now, so for people that are not familiar with you or your work, I mean, I don't think there's going to be that many, but tell us a little bit about you and yourself and the work that you do. Yeah, sure. So I'm James Dudkins. I've been involved in the discipline of customer experience for about a decade now. And before that, I had a music career, which actually turns out is all about customer experience too. So I was doing customer experience long before I actually ever really knew it existed. Mm -hmm. So I played guitar in a heavy metal band. We toured the world. We released albums. We were in all the rock and metal magazines. We had a music video on TV. And... um, so essentially, I used to be an actual, real-life, legitimate, award-winning rock star, but now I'm not. <laughs> now, now I'm a customer experience rock star. And basically, what I'm trying to do is help companies deliver rock star customer experiences, helping their customers turn into fans. Uh, I'm a best-selling author two times over now. I uh, got named as the UK's number one customer experience influencer in 2020 by Customer Experience Magazine. Uh, I was on the front cover of the Customer Experience Edition of 360 Magazine. Had a show on Amazon Prime called This Week in CX and lo- loads of other cool things. But, right, because of all those cool things, there are some people out there that think of me... <laughs> Kind kind of like a CX celebrity, like I'm just some sort of entertainer. But what they don't realize is that the only way I can do that cool stuff is because I've actually worked with some of the the world's most recognizable brands, teaching their teams how to think differently and systematically improve customer experience in a structured and replicable way. And look, that's brands like Disney, Lego, Adobe. Uh, Amex, uh, Mercedes, governments all over the world, airlines all over the world, and and even brands like Nike. And I know that each and every person listening to this and you yourself will have an amazing story of how you got your love of customer experience, which I would love to hear, by the way. Like, reach Mm -hmm. out and tell me that story. But I got my love of customer experience from being in a touring band. So for me, putting on an amazing show for fans night after night is exactly the same as delivering amazing experiences to customers day after day. So that's me. That's my mindset. That's my philosophy. Perfect. I mean, no, we, we should kind of set up a time to kind of like uh, to revisit backstories and things and, you know, share some notes. But I, I know that we've, over the last 15 months or so, you know, things have changed. And before we kind of dig into where you're at and what you're up to right now. I just wanted to say, James, how are you? And how have the last 15 or so months been for you? What do you mean about things have changed over the past 15 months? What? Oh, shut up. <laughs> Mate, I'm, I'm doing well. I'm doing good. It was a tough time. I think it was a tough time for a lot of people. Uh, lots of pivots needed to be pivoted because, of course... I was doing so much keynote speaking before I'd created a musical customer experience keynote Mm -hmm. where I was traveling around the world, teaching people about how to deliver rockstar customer experiences through the lens of music. But 
the uh, the pandemic made that somewhat difficult. So yeah, things were difficult, but um, got through it. Got through it well, which was fine. Um, so yeah, how are you? Uh, well, I mean, I've been really good. I mean, I think the initially, I think it was a bit of a, a shock, and it was like, oh my word, what's happening here? Um, but fascinatingly, the and a whole bunch of stuff kind of disappeared, but luckily I had some projects that, that, that kept going and just shifted to digital or yeah. to remote. And then a whole bunch of stuff kept coming back. And, and so I've been consistently busy, you know, thinking about things, writing new stuff, kind of like working with people, doing some stuff kind of online and things. And, and so I, I've really, you know, in the midst of all the strangeness, actually done really well and, and, and enjoyed it and actually got done, got, stuck into some new stuff which is coming up which is which is brilliant so but i think there's a lot has changed over the last sort of 15 months and some things have uh really come to the fore but i mean i wanted to understand what stood out for you with respect to service and experience what are the what are the big things you go on like thank goodness finally or yes or come on you know what what's been what have been the big highlights for you i think the 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 things that stood out the most to me were how woefully unprepared a lot mm-hmm. of companies were mm-hmm. and how it really highlighted flaws in their customer experience strategy. So f- for me, customer experience isn't really about the stuff that you do. It's about the way that you think. It's about the way you approach things, about your mindsets mm-hmm. and your principles. And th- there is really only a, a few steps, like high level, a few steps to getting customer experience right in my head. And that mm-hmm. is understand your customers, Mm -hmm. understand the outcomes they're trying to achieve, understand the needs that have to be delivered to achieve those, and then build experiences that deliver on them. Mm -hmm. That's that's really all you have to do. Now, if that was your philosophy before the pandemic, that doesn't really change because there's a pandemic. Now, the content of it will change, Mm -hmm. and the things you need to do will change quite rapidly Mm -hmm. and (laughs) quite randomly sometimes. Mm -hmm. But if you were doing customer experience right in the first place, there wouldn't really have been that massive, like that massive of a shock to the system. But yeah. I think what it did was highlight so many companies that don't think that way, that think that customer experience is what you do, and they've built their whole customer experience um, processes and procedures and teams and strategy around copying other people, just yeah, like yeah. doing stuff that other companies do. And of course, as soon as things had to start changing so rapidly and quickly. It all just fell apart. Mm. Yeah, I think there was also, for me, there was, um, it was, a, there was a massive, you know, it's almost like the, this, this spotlight got turned on the reality of many people's kind of efforts. And I would call it this kind of like um, the gap between rhetoric and activity got collapsed very, very quickly for some people. So there's a lot of people that were talking a good game, but actually not really, um, yeah. you know, properly playing. And they had to catch up really, really quickly, or else they would have been toast. Um, and so that's been heartening. Some people have not done, you know, have been exposed and try to catch up and have stumbled. And some people are still catching up. And some people are fared really well. So I think it's been a very mixed bag. But the some of this stuff, the, the good stuff has been has been it's been exceptional. Agreed. But um big thing, this is the big news, I guess, is that you recently had made a big announcement where you said you announced that you just joined Pega, who I know very well, they're good peoples, as a CX evangelist. Yeah. When I first heard that, I was like, oh, he's gone over to the dark side or not. Well, for, tell me, me about not- that. And tell me, why, do you, why have you joined them? Given that you were, kind of, you were doing the rock star sort of thing. I mean, the, the, tell me the, the story to, behind that because I, that's, for me, it's fascinating. I think it's brilliant because I think it's a great match. I know the people at folks at Pega, I like them a lot. Um, but I just wanted to hear it from you. Yeah, it's, um, for, for me, it is, it is like the perfect marriage of what I'm trying to do in the world and the capability to actually make it happen. Mm-hmm. Because, of course, for the past, what, four years now, mm-hmm. I've, really been focused on trying to inspire people, inspiring people to think differently, inspiring people to uh, approach customer experience in new ways and inspiring people to take action. And to be fair, like one of the biggest criticisms of me and what I do is about the taking action part. Right. And I'm I'm sure you will have heard conversations about this. Um, You might've even been involved in conversations about this, but 
it's all well and good for me to get up on stage and get people excited about changing customer experience, but without the help and the processes and the procedures and the technology to actually make it happen. Right. I, I don't want to say it's pointless because it isn't, but it doesn't have as big an impact mm-hmm. as it really could have. Right. And so when the opportunity came along to work with Pegra and when I started to see what they were actually capable of mm-hmm. and how I started to see that, Pega can actually make a lot of the ideas that I talk about come alive in companies. Mm-hmm. It was a bit of a no-brainer decision and of various things. Like, you will know this, most software companies gear themselves up. So, like, if a, if a customer needs to sneeze, they have to pay them more. Pega mm-hmm. isn't like that. Pega sets it up for customers to be self-sufficient. They can mm-hmm. make changes themselves in real time, instantaneously, reacting to customers, reacting to their needs. And not only is that good for the customers, it's good for the customers' customers, which mm-hmm. is good. And on top of that, which this is my biggest pet peeve when it comes to software companies, is most of them start with the software and then think, okay, how do we try and cram this into people's lives? Pega isn't like that. Pega have, have got a center out approach, mm-hmm. which starts with customer outcomes and then works backwards to the mm-hmm. technology. And that's mm-hmm. a message I've been sharing for over a decade. And finally, I can feel like I can back a company that shares the same customer-centric mindset that I do and that I'm going to be shouting about loud. Yeah. Is that, is, is that the kind of like what they're going to be having you do or get up to is like do lots of loud shouting or is like what 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 is it the what's the jd jd um so some of it will be about making loud noises by the way (laughs) yeah some of it will be about making loud noises which i'm good at um some of it's going to be internal as well Mm -hmm. inspiring people internally to you know think about customer experience in different ways to think about the ways that you know, our Pega people talk to our customers and inspire our customers. A lot of it is going to be getting in with our customers and in inspiring their employees to think about customer experience in different ways. Right. So it's it's really allowing me to take my customer experience message to a wider audience and in a way that was just it just wasn't possible before. Right. And so that means the rock stars here to stay, but just sort of in a in a in a in a Pega kind of context. Yeah. So I'm still a rock star, mate. That's never going anywhere. <laughs> just, just got a pega badge on me. I'm gonna get a pega tattoo on my neck and a hat and a t-shirt and all the and all, and all the rest. Are you gonna put a pega sticker on one of your guitars? Oh, I ain't gonna go that far. Come on. <laughs> Don't like him that much. <laughs> so, what about new? Because I know you're always kind of looking. You talk about music and you talk about fans and you talk about customer experience and things. I mean, are, have you got any? new research ideas that you're playing with that you that you think that joining Pega will help you bring to life? I mean, given that we, you know, what's the, what's, what, what are we kind of, what should we be looking out for as it were? Yeah. So one of the things that I've been thinking about quite a lot at the moment is this idea of fandom. Mm-hmm. And of course I specifically am thinking about music fandom, but fandoms exist Anywhere you have Star Wars fandoms, Harry Potter fandoms, sports fandoms. There are team football teams all over the world with crazy fandoms, Formula One fandoms. Fandoms occur in lots of places. And what I've started to see is that in COVID, the way that people react to things have really changed. And I think to understand that, we need to understand how relationships are built between Mm -hmm. two parties. And Edward T. Hall wrote a a book back in 1966. I can't remember the name of it, but it was talking about um, how uh, how people form relationships. And uh, that was written about in the book Fanocracy that we were talking about the other day. Yeah, the one with David Meerman Scott. Yeah, so so David wrote about that. And I was was listening to that and it really made me think about just relationships in general. And the whole whole idea is, is that we make relationships based on proximity, how close we can get to another person. Mm -hmm. So within one and a half foot is your intimate space. And that's where you make your closest relationships. Mm -hmm. And the... The way I started thinking about it was that over the years, from cave people all the way to now, we've worked very hard to try and circumvent that. 
mm-hmm. by cave people leaving messages on walls all the way through to people sending letters <laughs> with carrier pigeons and ravens and things mm-hmm. all the way through to radio, all the way through to TV and film, all the way through to the internet. Mm-hmm. Now, the internet has probably been the most effective at this because it allows for that two-way reciprocal relationship to happen. Mm-hmm. So you can make very real and very reciprocal relationships with people over the internet that aren't even on the same continent as mm-hmm. you, let alone within that one and a half foot intimate space. Mm-hmm. And there's been a hyper depletion of human contact during the pandemic mm-hmm. and a hyper reliance on the virtual world. Mm-hmm. And what that has meant is that people's emotions have become hyper magnified. And it right. means that stories have become hyper amplified mm-hmm. and what both good and bad. Mm-hmm. And what it's made me realize is there is this next level of fandom emerging that I'm referring to as the hyper fan. Right. Now, this isn't a person who just likes another thing. It's not even just a person who loves another thing. It's a person who makes that other thing, a, you know, a key part of their identity it becomes part of them. Now, there are companies with hyperfans. I bet you, can, you know, people who, like Apple, for example, people who think that owning an Apple computer is a personality trait. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> they yeah. have those hyperfans. And that's what I'm looking into a little bit more. I want to look into music artists that have these hyperfans, that have people that use the connection with them as part of their identity. And I want to say, well, what can we do in business to emulate that? What can we do to turn our customers into hyper fans? So that's, mm-hmm. that's what I'm looking at right now. Awesome. I mean, I think it reminds me of a, of a thing that I've sort of explored before is looking at relationships. And, and it, the, you know, the way that I looked at it was like, you know, I sort of described good relationships having two different dynamics. One is interesting and interested as it were, and how the strongest relationships have both different sort of um, kind of things and it can fluctuate depending on time and context and so on and so forth because it has that sort of implies it's a two-way thing and that's the strength of it because um, being just interesting or just being interested is, it's it's just, it implies one way and just like, I think you're you're absolutely right, there is this... um, when you think about it in those kind of ways, it's like how these things get fused together and, and, and you know, build much, much greater meaning, as it were. Yeah. I th- and I think it's that reciprocal nature that turns it into a hyper fandom. Because, mm-hmm. of course, like for, for years and years and years, we've listened to music, we've gone to the cinema and seen people um, on the big screen, and we have formed, you know, a fandom around them. Mm-hmm. But now because of the internet and how much is happening on there, like those people, those people that we would never talk to, never get to see, we're getting to see every mm-hmm. day within that one and a half foot intimate space. They're actually talking to us. We are forming reciprocal relationships with these movie stars or music artists or rock stars. And it's, it's that for me that has built this next level of fan which, which yeah. I'm referring to as the hyper fan. Basically, I'm just calling it that because I didn't, like super fan was already taken and I needed mm-hmm. another thing. Yeah. So <laughs> no, no, I think that's fine. I mean, but when you're talking there, it reminds me of the um, the one thing that talking about a music example. Like uh, one of my favourite little uh, music uh, stories, video stories that I saw was I don't know if you ever saw it. There was um, there was the rapper Dave that played at Glastonbury uh, a couple of years ago. I think it might be in 2019, and he's got this one song called uh, Tiago Silva. And he was looking for somebody in the audience to come and help him with the song on stage, just as an impromptu thing. And he spotted this young guy called Alex, I think it was, who was actually wearing a PSG football shirt with Tiago Silva's number and name on the back. Yeah. And he he was gonna he picked him out of the crowd. He said, "Do you know the words?" And he was then there singing the words eggs to him. He said he had him up on stage, and they did this duet for, of of the actual track where the guy was actually kind of like rhyming the uh, the track on his own in front of the, the, the massive Glastonbury kind of crowd. And I thought it was just a beautiful thing around collapsing the the gap between the artist and the fan just through, you know, pure, uh, you know, taking a risk and participation and things. It was just, if you haven't seen it, 
you should totally check it out because it's absolutely wonderful. And to be fair to the, the guy, Alex, he smashes it on stage in front of thousands and thousands of people at, at Glastonbury. It's brilliant. Yeah, I think I've, I think I've seen that, but I will re-watch it. Um, it's amazing. And to be fair, it's a really good story to talk about another point when it comes to this idea of fandom. And what I've started to realise looking into this a little deeper is that all of us, whether it be you are a rapper, whether it be you're a sports star, whether it be you're a company, we're all just one moment away from creating a hyper fan. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's understanding the hierarchy of these interactions. So moments, if you bundle moments together, you've got an experience. Mm-hmm. Experiences create emotions, good and bad. Mm-hmm. Those emotions are stored as memories mm-hmm. and your relationship with another party, really all it is is just a collection of memories. That's all it is. Mm-hmm. So relationships are just collections of memories that are the way that we store emotions that are created by experience that are just collections of lots of little moments. Mm-hmm. We are yeah. all just one, one moment away from creating that hyper fan. And it's yeah. moments like that that can do it. There's, there's loads of stories. There's one that I share in um, my talk, Hyper Fandom, mm-hmm. which is a virtual talk that I wrote during lockdown that talks about Foo Fighters, right. where they got a little kid from the crowd to come and rock out on stage with them. Right. That one moment will have turned that kid into a hyper fan. But the interesting thing is, it probably will have also turned the 45,000 people at that show mm-hmm. into a hyper fan too. Because mm-hmm. there's something interesting that, again, was in the um, fanocracy book about mirror neurons. Yes. Like we, we've got neurons in our brain that when we see something good or bad happening, we kind of feel like it's happening to us as well. Mm-hmm. It's why we wince when we see someone's arm get chopped off on a horror film. Mm-hmm. It's why we smile and tear up when we see something romantic. I mean, not me, I don't do that. But when other people see something <laughs> romantic on TV, it's because there's part of us that feels like it happened to us too. And not only does it make you feel like you were there, it gives you a story to tell. Mm. And it allows you to talk to other people too. And every other person that you tell, they become part of the story. And every person they tell, they become part of the story too. So that one moment not only could create one hyper fan, it could create thousands. Oh, I think so. I think the, you know, you mentioned the Foo Fighters there. And I think I remember the documentary that they made about the album called, it was called Sonic Cities or something like that, where they kind of went to a different city and met all the, and because they had stories that connected them to those cities. And then, and those stories were almost the inputs and the environment that helped them create that sort of song. And so it was almost like, uh, um, the album was a, almost like a travelogue of stories in many ways. And yeah. uh, that, I think that was brilliant because it means that, you know, you, you end up with all these different communities that have connections to that piece of work. Which was automatically that you've already you've already created that sort of like subgroup of hyper fans, as, as as you say. Definitely, I'm going to check that out. Send me the link to that documentary, please. Uh, no, yeah, we'll do. Um, I think it's I can't. I think it's called Sonic something, but it's yeah, and it's it's there. It's brilliant um, because it, the one of my favourite um, uh, episodes is where Dave Grohl is from just outside Washington, D.C. in Virginia, I think. Yep. And he, he was a big fan of the, the Washington, D.C. hardcore scene and particularly all the stuff going on around Discord Records and Fugazi. So he went, goes and goes and meets people like Ian Mackay and stuff. And and that was the stuff that got him into music, that whole punk scene, post-punk scene. And, and so, it, yeah, it's brilliant. And then they go to New Orleans and lots of other different places. So it's, yeah, brilliant. I'll send you a link. Have you ever noticed how similar Dave Grohl looks to the drummer of Nirvana? <laughs> I wonder if that's going to catch anyone out. So anyway, so what? Um, so just finishing on the kind of the Pega sort of like stuff. And in, what are you most excited about uh, going forward? What's the, the big things that you're looking out for? Apart from the idea that we're going to be able to go for beers at Pega World next year, fingers crossed, as it were. Right, that's it. Basically, they they said, look, James, Adrian's probably going to be at Pega World. We'll we'll get some beers in. I was like, sold. I mean, <laughs> um, but yeah, other than that, the Pega are doing, to, basically Pega are going to change the world of customer experience, the plans that are in the pipeline, the stuff that's going to be happening. It's blowing my mind mm-hmm. right now. And I, I can't 
wait to start sharing that with the world and seeing some of these ideas that until very recently have remained very high level, quite idealistic customer experience ideas to see those come alive and see those start transforming businesses and customers' lives. So I am, in case you couldn't tell, very, very super excited about that. Awesome. So James, is there anything else that you'd like to kind of just highlight or pick out before? I mean, I just want to then ask you some general kind of questions about things that you're seeing um, in the service and experience. I mean, anything else you want to kind of highlight before we kind of get and in, dig into that? I'm good. Okay. So here's the thing. So you, as you say, you've been in this sort of space for over a decade now and, you know, you're a, a, a watcher, an actor, a commentator, an agitator, an, in, an instigator, all of those different sort of things for, in terms of, better outcomes and things. But what is it, what do you think the future of service and experience looks like? And what do you think are some of the key challenges that are ahead that we need to sort of be mindful of or navigate our way around or over or under or whatever? I think the, the future of customer experience is going to lean heavily on technology and the biggest hurdles are going to be technology. Mm. I think it's, it's, it's both the problem and the answer to a lot of issues that are going on right, right now. Now, again, don't get me wrong, I'm not going to immediately start to be like, hey, technology first. Still for me, technology is the thing that helps those amazing experiences come alive. You, you need to understand your customers, the outcomes, the needs, you build those experiences and then see how technology can help them come alive. Um, specifics moving forward, I think we are going to see some revolutionary stuff happening around personalization. And mm -hmm. of course, that term hyper personalization, which plays very well into the stuff I'm talking about right now. But really, one to one personalization, every experience being unique mm -hmm. to that customer, being completely relevant, uh, being completely designed to deliver the, a specific outcome in a specific time, in a specific manner, in the specific way that best suits the customer. I think that's going to be pro probably the, the biggest one for me. Okay. I mean, I guess it, it's almost a bit like rather than it's moving from a bit of a fixed way of doing things, um, almost to, to moving to almost like a it's like liquid infrastructure in many ways. Yeah. So look, we most companies out there have quite an industrial age mindset. Mm -hmm. They it's quite a process mindset. And then we try and apply it to the customer experience world. And it doesn't always work because it's, it's, it was never created for a world that we've got today with such complexity. Mm -hmm. And one of the relics from the, you know, the industrial age is standardization. Mm -hmm. It's trying to make everything the same. And dude, when you are making a table, yeah, you need your processes to be exactly the same every single time because the outcome needs to be exactly the same every single time. Mm -hmm. But then when you enter a world where the outcome needs to be different, dependent on the customer, standardization doesn't really cut it anymore. And it's almost like you need to move to a world of customization. Or if you want to call it, you could call it micro standardization, mm -hmm. where there are certain certain subsets of customers or certain outcomes or certain needs that have certain standardization. But instead of having three standard processes, you end up with three million standard processes. And it's almost understanding that there are going to be infinite journeys, infinite paths for your customers. And you can't get to that hyper-personalized state with hyper-standardization. Mm. No, no, that's kind of fair. I mean, but yeah, I guess, or you maybe have to combine the two. Like if you're making a product that needs to be standardized, like I, it's a high precision thing. Um, and, but you've got to combine that with the kind of the whole personalization that wraps around it, the kind of the service and the support and kind of the, 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 the experience that, the, the, that wraps around it, which is that you kind of strike that, you've got to strike that balance, I guess, as well. Yeah. It's, I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, Producing an actual physical thing, standardization is still a pretty good idea to make sure it's exactly the same every single time, mm -hmm. to make sure that it's consistent and to make sure that it's meeting customers' expectations on quality and functionality, et cetera, et cetera. But then when it comes to the service side and there isn't a product involved, there's a person involved, it doesn't work anymore because mm -hmm. it was never created for that. It was created for a different world, different mindset, a different environment. So it's not to say that standardization is dead. It's just that standardization is not right 
to personalise customer experiences because yeah. they won't be standard because people aren't standard. Yeah, no, that's fair. So James, I mean, I know that you know you alluded to it um, earlier. So the difference between the industrial world and kind of like the modern world, which is you know becoming increasingly increasingly complex, and sometimes the complexity gets in the way of us doing things or taking action or making changes. And a lot of the time that's about generating momentum or taking the first steps as it were. Yeah. So for someone listening into this or reading the highlights and, you know, they, they really want to improve their service or experience that they deliver to their customers. But they're a bit like, Oh my word, I'm looking at the size of this thing and it's enormous. Well, you know, where what would be your best advice in terms of where to start you know, to generate that momentum that that you know that they they're gonna need to generate in order to you know to start making the changes that they want to? I don't for me personally, I don't necessarily think there is one blanket answer to that of the best place to start. But because I'm putting the, you on the spot, James. I'm putting yeah, you on the spot. It's, and I'm gonna give a diplomatic answer that it, <laughs> it depends, it depends on the maturity of your company it depends on the size of your company. It depends on what you do. It depends on where you are in the world. It depends on the type of customers you got. But mm. if we are looking for one blanket thing that we can do to start this journey, that probably is a good idea, no matter who you are, no matter where you are in the world, no matter what you do, no matter what the size of your company, no matter what the maturity of your company, it's probably go and talk to some of your customers. Mm-hmm. Simples, as you say on the on the on the advert. Yes, other insurance meerkats are available. <laughs> exactly. Actually, I don't think there are. I think there's only one. <laughs> I don't think we really want them to be more, actually. No. Um, yeah. But no, I think that's that, that's kind of fair. I mean, sometimes the simple simple stuff is the most powerful things, and it's it's fascinating to see in an increasingly technologically kind of powered world how sometimes the simple things and the most human things are the things that can give us the greatest insight or be the most compelling and the most powerful and mm. the most impactful. So James, before we go, as you know, um, I published this book called Punk CX back in uh, summer of 2019. And since then, I've been asking all the people that I've had on the podcast for a couple of sort of almost like word association uh, questions around Punk CX and what, they, um, and what it means to them. So the first question that I wanted to ask you is like, what one or two words would you use to describe a more punk approach or a punk approach to customer experience? And I'll put you on notice. I've collected 134 different words and phrases so far. So there's challenges to try and pick one that's um, not on the list to make it 135. Okay, right. How many how many chances have I got? Um, Can I just keep going until I get one? <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. Let me kind of pull up my list, and I'll tell you kind of when I'll, I'll, when the when the buzzer goes. Okay. Um, unapologetic. I'm pretty sure that's on. Lame. Um, <laughs> <laughs> in your face. Not on. That's not on. I don't think so. Oh. Cool. Oh, good. well, that's good because I had an alternate spelling as well. Oh, no. In, it, in, it, sorry, I'm wrong. It is on. Oh. How about in your face, spelt Y E R? Yeah, that's too close. Ah, Not allowed. D I Y. Uh, already there. Raw. Already there. Aggressive. Uh, 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 I thought that was already there. Um, uh, da, 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 but I can't see it. So, no, you can have that. Woohoo! <laughs> nice. And the second question is, what company or brand do you think epitomizes uh, punk ethos when it comes to customer experience? Okay. So, right, rather than, in the spirit of your list, rather than give you one that people might expect, let me mm. give you a bit of a, a weird one that I think okay. is quite quite a punk company. Mm-hmm. All right, are you ready? Mm-hmm. Aldi. Cool. I think Aldi are pretty punk. They basically they do what they want. They do their own thing. They're 
suit their, their anti-establishment, especially all that stuff with Marks and Spencers, who are like a British institution. They were like going to war with Marks and Spencer. I think Aldi are super punk. They do things differently. They don't care about like the, you know, the establishment. They're not for everybody. They only mm-hmm. really attract a certain type of customer and that's okay. They are mm-hmm. unapologetic about that. For me, Aldi epitomise punk. Nice. I like it. It's kind of one of those kind of things that's hiding in plain sight. And you, yeah. ju- you just you just highlight kind of like, you know, something that they know intimately and they play on, but actually it also shows you the possibility of it. It's like punk doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have green hair and kind of, a, a, you know, a nose ring or something. You know, it, it actually, it's just, a, as you kind of said right at the beginning, it's, a lot of it's just about mindset and the way you go about things. Yep. Perfect. So, James, thank you for all of that. Um, congratulations on the um, the move over to Pega. Um, I think, you, as I said to you before, you're amongst good people. So I've known them for a long time, and I think some of the stuff that they they do is 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 brilliant. So, congratulations on that. Um, all the very best for going forward, and uh, I look forward to sharing a few beers at Tiger World, fingers crossed, next year. And finally, just thank you for your time, sharing your time and your experience and your insight with us today. That's been super cool. You're welcome, mate. Thank you for having me back again for the sequel. (laughs) All the best. Well, that was cool. I hope you enjoyed it. I did, and I always do actually, because I always learn something new when I speak to some of these amazing kind of people. And it's always something new that I can incorporate into my writing, speaking workshops, and other sort of advisory work that I do. Now, if you're interested in learning about any of that sort of stuff, uh, then you can find out more about how I work with clients over at adrianswisco.com. But one final thing before I go, please consider heading over to iTunes or Spotify or whichever podcast platform you choose to use, and do leave a review. Every little helps, as they say. Anyway, that's all for now. Thank you for listening. And do tune in again soon. All the very best. Cheers. Bye.